All right, welcome, welcome. Good to see so many of you this evening. And thank you, uh, KOP Moms, for that very nice special music. And um, I tell you, they all look pretty young to be mom, you know? And God bless them with good voice to, to um, bless us this evening with that really nice song about coming together as one. Tonight, we have a very special message on, I call it, the coming of the third Elijah. This particular message, actually, it comes from the Old Testament. So we're going to start our journey this evening with the Old Testament, but then we're going to end up in the New Testament in the book of Revelation. And this particular topic comes from the very last book in the Old Testament, is the book, book of Malachi. And then we're going to look at the very last chapter. And then we're going to look at the very, one of the very last verses in the last chapter of the last book in the Old Testament. So, this is really, really special one. Maybe you heard something about it, but I pray and hope that you understand it tonight. So let's get right into it. In Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5, the Bible says, Behold, I will send you who? Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So the Bible says, God will send who? Elijah, before when? The coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord is talking about the second coming of Christ. Because, my friends, great and dreadful day, dreadful day is referring to when God will execute the judgment. In fact, do you remember a few nights ago when Jesus comes back, all inhabitants will ask the question, for the great day of his wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? Similar idea before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord or the wrath, the great day of his wrath. Same idea. So this is really talking about the second coming of Jesus. So it says, God will send Elijah to this world before the second coming of Jesus. But let me ask you something, ladies and gentlemen. Elijah, where is Elijah today? Where is he today? He is in heaven. He is in heaven. You remember the story? How he was taken up to heaven? We're going to read a little bit about that a little bit later. So, is this text saying God will send down Elijah from heaven down to earth before the second coming? What is this talking about? Should we expect Elijah to come? Because this is pretty significant. Um, prophecy. This also tells us that before the second coming of Jesus, we are going to see Elijah. So let's look deeper into this. All right then, Elijah coming before the second coming of Christ. But then in the Bible, um, we have the, I call it the first Elijah the little Elijah, the one that went up to heaven uh, without seeing death, uh, he is recorded. The story of that Elijah is mentioned in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. And again, I call him the first Elijah. Elijah the Toshibai. But then we are going to study about uh, how John the Baptist, who did I say? John the Baptist, how he came in the spirit of Elijah. 
So in a sense, John the Baptist was like Elijah, not Elijah himself, but he came in the characteristics and the spirit and the power of Elijah. So we're going to study about John the Baptist in the book of Luke and the book of Matthew, and I call him the second Elijah, John the Baptist, all right? And if you remember, John the Baptist, he was sent before the first coming of Jesus. God ordained John the Baptist to prepare the way, in other words, get the people ready to accept Jesus. You remember? And accept Jesus at the time we're talking about Jesus' first coming. But then, you remember Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, is talking about how God will send Elijah. So I have to call him, as far as I can see in the Bible, the third Elijah. And I, so far, what, what I can tell you, Elijah in the last days and before the second coming of Christ. So this is how we understand, or this is the reason why I say the coming of the third Elijah. Okay? Why, my friends? Because the characteristics, if you notice what's going on is, if you, when you look at this uh, chart, you can begin to understand what is really going on, and that is this. You see, God sent, or God raised a prophet, and his name was Elijah in the days of the uh, kings back in the Old Testament time. A little guy named, his name Elijah the Toshbite. And he was a prophet. But then the Bible says he will send other people that are like Elijah. Not Elijah in heaven, but other people are like Elijah to prepare the way for first coming, and that was John the Baptist. And according to the book of Malachi, before the second coming, and that will be, and that is where we're going tonight. That is the focus of our study this evening, to figure out who is or who are the third Elijah in the last days, because this is really important. Are you getting, are you seeing the big picture? All right then. Let's continue. So let's learn something about the first Elijah. Why? Here's the reason why. In, now listen, listen very carefully. In order for us to figure out the characteristics of the third Elijah, we have to study the characteristics of the first Elijah. And then we have to study the characteristics of the second Elijah. And then we put the characteristics of the first Elijah and the characteristics of the second Elijah, put those characteristics together in order for us to pinpoint exactly who are the third Elijahs in the last days. Are you with me? You do, you do see what I'm doing? Because when God, uh, when God chooses his people to be Elijah, he is basically repeating the same characteristics over and over again. So let's figure out the characteristics of the first Elijah. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, And Elijah the Toshibite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, and said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these days, but according to my word. Let me explain to you what's going on. You see, God has chosen Elijah, Toshibai, to be a mouthpiece or a messenger, okay? A prophet, but basically a messenger, a give a message to King Ahab, all right? And King Ahab, um, Israel king, but he was in a great apostasy. He was going against God because he married a wrong woman. So gentlemen, gentlemen, listen very carefully, okay? Now, you make sure when you get married, don't marry a wrong woman like Jezebel. Say amen. 
Man, that amen was not strong enough. I need a strong amen like an army amen. Come on. Amen. Uh, all right, now, that sounds better. That sounds better. I need, to hear that. I need to hear that from you. Because, ladies and gentlemen, let me speak to the gentlemen now, because many times, you know, men have made a big mistakes by choosing a wrong person to marry. So be very careful. Don't be, don't be like Ahab marrying Jezebel. So, first Elijah, basically, he was a messenger. What does that mean? Well, second Elijah is a messenger, and the third Elijah is going to be a messenger or messengers. Let's continue. And what was really going on during that time? Well, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30, the Bible says, And Ahab did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Yeah, the Bible says he was a very evil king. And verse 31, it says, He took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ephabal, king of Zidonians, and went and served, what? Baal and, ah, you see, a wrong marriage led him to worship the wrong God. That's what happened. So it, it's like a, a Christian king marrying a pagan woman, and they end up both of them worshiping pagan gods. Oh, what a sad story here. And then 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17. Look, uh, pay attention here because we're about to figure out the exact characteristic or exact messages of the first Elijah. Because when we study about the third Elijah, the characteristics, characteristics are going to be the characteristics of the messages in the first Elijah and the second Elijah. So pay attention to what was Elijah's message. Here we go. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah. And Ahab said unto him, Are thou he that troubleth Israel? Basically Ahab saying, Elijah, you are the troublemaker. Yeah? Yeah? So he was accusing Elijah for bringing trouble. But then Elijah was bold and courageous, and he answered and said, I have not troubled Israel, but thou thy father's house in that. So he basically says, I'm not a troublemaker, you are. Ah, what an argument they had. But then Elijah began to point out exactly what, what, what the problems were. It says, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Look at that. What was that great apostasy? Basically, forsaking the commandments of God and worshiping idols. So then what was the message of Elijah? Elijah's message was simply is this. Keep God's commandments and don't worship idols. Instead of worshiping idols, worship who? But what kind of God? True God. And what kind of God is a true God? Living God. What kind of God is a living God? Creator. That's right. We have some very good students out there. So Elijah's message, what were they? First Elijah, messenger. And then his message, keep God's commandments and worship the Creator. And then the Bible says in verse 21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answer him not a word. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burn sacrifice. Now, if you study the story of Elijah, the, his uh, showdown, so to speak, showdown of uh, who worships the true God on Mount Carmel, Elijah said, let's have a contest. So he gathered, he called all the false prophets or false religious leaders he said, you gather yourselves and build yourself an altar. Altar made out of stone. And he said, all right, you, you bring your own sacrifice. You bring your own wood. 
And you ask God for fire to come down to burn your sacrifice. And I am going to do the same thing. I'm going to build me an altar with stones, and I'm going to uh, put the wood on top, and I'm going to put the sacrifice on top, and both of us are going to ask our God. You can ask your God. I'm going to ask my God and to see who answers whose prayer. So there was a great showdown. You see, the reason why uh, Elijah was challenging them for asking their God for fire, that is because, listen, Baal worship, yeah, this Baal worship is really connected to sun worship. Meaning their God is their sun, meaning their God is their fire, you understand. In fact, one of the major God in the, among the pagans is sun worship. Yeah, worshiping the sun. So he's basically saying, if you worship the sun and if your God is a fire, I'm sure he has no problem sending some fire down to your offering. That's why. That's why. He, so when the altars are all prepared, he basically called out and said, how long are you going to stand in between the two opinions and two, uh, two ideas? Follow, if, if Baal is your God, follow him. If God is your God, follow him. Make your decision. But then if you know what happened, all the false prophets... Oh, they were, they did, they, they built the altar, put the web, put the sacrifice, and then they start crying out, oh, Baal, oh, Baal. They start crying out, singing, and they cry even louder, start screaming and shouting, and then the Bible says they were jumping. Now, <laughs> some uh, a Bible historian said the reason why these false prophets were jumping around the altar because they're trying to see how they can put a match of fire into the, into the sacrifice. <laughs> it's like a little illusion, disguise. But from far distance, the, the false prophets, what were they doing? They were shouting and dancing. Wait a minute, that sounds like some of the churches today, huh? Uh, jumping around, shouting, you know, crying out to God, like God is not there to listen. And Elijah began to have, I think Elijah was like me, a little bit funny sometimes. Elijah says, oh, maybe here God went to a vacation. You better cry a little louder. Oh, they, they start doing that uh, early uh, in the beginning of the day and all day until almost come to the close of the day, just before the sunset, they stopped. And then Elijah said, it's my turn. He humbly built the altar, put the wood, and put the sacrifice, and he even put a trench around the altar. Trench for what? He poured so much water on the sacrifice. Why? Because no one can accuse him for putting a match into the sacrifice. So, pour water, put the trench, and then Elijah just humbly pray. He did not dance. He did not shout. He just simply knelt down and prayed. And then the Bible says, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. And I didn't put all the verses, but the Bible says it not only consumed the sacrifice, but the wood and the altar, the stone, and everything, and the water, everything was gone. And after that, people were like, your God is a true God. And then through Elijah, God put forth a judgment against false prophets. It was a victorious day at the same time. It was a sad day because people were so, so stubborn, so, so stubborn to stay in their wrong ways. They were not willing to change. They can see God's way is right and true, but they refused to follow. But then there are other people that follow the true God. So first Elijah, 
his characteristics. Number one, messenger. Number two, keep God's commandments. And number three, basically what? Worship the Creator. Because my friend, they may say their God is a fire, but who made the fire? <laughs> the Creator, right? So Creator is always higher than any gods of the earth, if there is any. All right? So that, those were the messages of the first Elijah. And then what happened to Elijah? 2 Kings 2, verse 11, the Bible says, Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So Elijah never died. So first Elijah, a messenger. His message, keep God's commandments. His message, worship the Creator and gone to heaven without seeing death. So we are going to see these characteristics in the third Elijah, and we'll look at it later. Now let's look at second Elijah in the Bible. The Bible says in Luke chapter 1, verse 13, Zacharias, speaking to Zacharias, thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. This is talking about John the Baptist. And then the very, and then a few verses down, the Bible says, and he shall go before him in the what? Spirit and power of Elias. So this makes it pretty clear that someone can come in the spirit of Elijah. Now, don't get confused. Uh, that's just the old uh, New Testament way of uh, writing the word Elijah. Instead of saying Elijah, Elias. But Elias, Elijah, same thing, okay? Same person. So it says, in the spirit and power of Elijah. So not Elijah, but in the spirit, in the characteristics of Elijah. So John the Baptist represents that second Elijah. You see right there? And then it says, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. To make ready a people, prepare for the what? Ah, you see? And, you know, some, you know what some people say? So, so John the Baptist, he is the one that prepared the way for the first coming of Jesus. Now, some have observed that, uh, you remember the first Elijah? Okay, after first Elijah gone to heaven, who took his place? Elisha, yeah. And some people have observed that uh, Elijah, Elijah, is, he was more like John the Baptist because he was preaching, uh, asking people to make decisions, more like John the Baptist. And Elisha, in a sense, he was like Jesus. Why? He was more of that healing type, teaching type, and that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus, did lot, Jesus he did a lot more healing and teaching, just like Elisha. So, See, the Bible tends to repeat the same characteristics over and over again. We call this history repeats. Even Jesus used this kind of uh, understanding. Jesus said, the last days will be very similar to in the days of Noah. So if you want to understand the condition and the characteristics of the last days, Study in the days of Noah, because what happened in the days of Noah will be repeated in the future before the coming of Christ. We call that history repeat. So in this case, we have Elijah, the first Elijah, and Elisha. Elijah is more like John the Baptist. Elisha is more like Jesus. Similar characteristics being repeated. But then this will, will repeat again in the third Elijah as a messengers and instead of first coming, second coming of Jesus Christ. See, to prepare for the Lord. Same ideas. All right then. Second Elijah, messenger, John the Baptist. Then what was his message? What was the message of John the Baptist? Well, there were many, but one of them is in John chapter 1, verse 29, the Bible says, the next day John sees Jesus coming unto him and saith, 
John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And we talked about this in our first meeting, you remember? Yeah? John the Baptist, he had many options in terms of title for Jesus Christ. Many descriptions. There are more than 200 different names and titles, descriptions of Jesus Christ in the Bible. John the Baptist could have used just any of them. It would be okay. But John the Baptist, he used this title, the Lamb of God. Why? Why? So, when John the Baptist said, in, in front of many Jewish people standing there above the river, near the bank of the river, some of them in the water, in the river of uh, 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 the river Jordan, and people are just everywhere. And then when, when he saw Jesus coming, John the Baptist says, everybody, basically, everybody, behold the Lamb of God. So when Jewish people, they were standing, when they heard the title, Lamb of God, and look, in their mind, Lamb of God is associated with what kind of activities? Lamb of God. What kind of activities? Sacrifice, exactly. And Jewish people, they perform sacrifice, what specific location? Sanctuary, exactly. So when he says, behold the Lamb of God, it's... He was really saying, John the Baptist was really saying, all Jewish people, all Israel, you have been doing animal sacrifice, particularly lamb sacrifice, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But all those animal sacrifices were pointing to the Messiah who will come to be our sacrifice, the true sacrifice. So when John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God, he was basically saying, Here is the one that will fulfill, one that will fulfill sanctuary service. So John the Baptist, he was really basically preaching not only the Messiah, but sanctuary. So he was preaching his message, Jesus and the sanctuary service. Jesus and the sanctuary service. Let's continue. And then the Bible says, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye for the what? Kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he is preaching, kingdom of God is near. So what was his message? Second Elijah, messenger John the Baptist he was preaching Jesus and the sanctuary service and he was really preaching preparing for the first coming of Jesus and then the Bible says and the same John had his raiment of what camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins and his meat was locusts and wild Honey, now let me ask you something. Why do you think the Bible tells us his fashion option and his diet option? Do you know anybody in the Bible, any other prophet in the Bible, we have a description of like what they were wearing and what they were eating? Do you know what the Bible says about what Moses ate? No. Do you know any other prophets in the Bible that the Bible actually gives us, like what they ate? Maybe, da maybe Daniel, but not that many prophets in the Bible. But this, become, but this one is really, really specific. John had his Raymond camel's hair. How many of you, oh, I guess you don't need to wear camel's hair here because it's too hot here. What is it like to have uh, wear a camel leather jacket. Will there be a big hump in the back? I'm not sure. Why is the Bible mentioning this? What for? And why is the Bible says 
He, his food was locusts. You know what locusts are? Grasshoppers. Now, in some translations or sometimes, that word locust can be, can be translated to a, a type of bean pod. And some people believe that to be like carob. Carob is the, the flavor of carob is very close to chocolate. But it's not chocolate, okay? <laughs> It's not chocolate, but it was like chocolate, carob. But anyhow, it doesn't really matter because according to the Bible, in the Old Testament, locust, if it is grasshopper, is a clean food. Now, don't get too excited to go eat grasshopper tomorrow. Spare their life, please. I remember in Cambodia, they were uh, frying grasshopper. And believe it or not, I had a 1% appetite for that. Why is it? Because I used to eat grasshopper <laughs> a long time ago. And uh, now, please don't let me lead you to eat grasshopper, okay? But it was pretty good. <laughs> but anyhow, anyhow, why is the Bible mentions about his diet his, and his dress? Here's the reason why, ladies and gentlemen. Back in those days, if anyone is wearing like a camel's hair, you know what that means? He is sent by God or messenger of God, meaning his clothing, listen very carefully, his clothing easily show to people that he is dedicated to God. What do you say? So the Bible is saying, so John the Baptist is his an example Example of what? How to dress. In what way? We should dress in such a way that we can easily tell people we believe God. You know, long, long time ago, long, 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 long time ago, uh, I had dog, dog chain around my neck. I had a metal plate that says King Cobra. I had a jacket, and the back of my jacket it's all painted, King Cobra, other words, you know, evil eye looking out, yeah? And then I have a spiky things on my wrist, yeah? And then I had my, uh, um, I had a big belt that says King. And then I had a big radio with all colored and graffiti. If I come to you like that with long hair, can you say, oh, this guy believes in God? Now, obviously, we should not judge people in terms of their true character, but if we, sometimes we do judge people based upon what they wear, yes or no? That's just natural. If we know that, then we should utilize that to represent God. What do you say? So we should dress in such a way that we can represent the truth and the love of Jesus Christ. Not so much of just always following. I'm not saying all fashions are wrong, but let me tell you something. Sometimes these worldly fashions, is crazy. Yeah? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah? Like things are getting like shorter and shorter and shorter. Yeah? It's, it's, it, gets, it gets too crazy and it can confuse what we're trying to say. So John the Baptist, why was he wearing that? Well, back in those days, they had another mm, dress, fashion, deform. Uh, let me explain. You see, back in those days, Pharisees and Sadducees, especially, especially Sadducees, they loved to wear long robes, extra clothing, and they loved to go to the marketplace like this. It's like, here comes Sadducee, here comes Pharisee, move out of the way, here comes holy man, right? Uh, now, I know for us, clothing can be a pleasant thing, and it gives you a sense of confidence, and sometimes, you know, a little positive thinking. Now, I'm not talking about that's bad, 
But you know, back in those days, they were trying to show their pride in their clothes. But John the Baptist came in a humble clothing, simple clothing. So there was a great contrast between religious leaders and this humble homeschool kid who lives in the wilderness. So that's the reason why the Bible mentions about his lifestyle. And then the Bible says his meat was locusts and wild honey. Now, I'm sure he has some other types of food as well. But the Bible decided to only mention those two things. Why? Because the Bible is trying to say that his diet was simple. Meaning, I know, it might be grasshopper, but the idea of simplicity means healthy. So John the Baptist had healthy dressing and healthy diet. Why was that important? Why do you think John the Baptist, he needed to live like that? He needs to give glory to God whatever he eats or whatever he does. Why? Here's the reason why, ladies and gentlemen. Can you imagine if John the Baptist, he was not a temp, a he didn't practice temperance, if he didn't practice self-control. Now, I am about to say something. This may offend some people. Now, if I offend you, I'm not trying to offend you, okay? But just imagine with me. Now, if some people are big, not due to their diet, for some other reason, we understand, okay? But can you imagine if John the Baptist, if he, was, if he didn't have a self-control, he was just eating whatever he likes to eat, and then can you imagine John the Baptist like this big? Really fat? And then can you imagine him coming out of the, I don't know, cave? And he sees the people, and, he, and as he's you know, touching his tummy, he says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And the people will look at him and say, huh, he tells us to repent. You repent. You see, my friends, um, if you don't live the message, your message is not, it doesn't have power. It's like you're trying to throw a feather. You know, have you ever tried to throw a feather? Yeah? And then you just, you know, you try and throw that feather as hard as you can. <clears throat> what happens? <clears throat> just like that. You see, God knew that in, in order for holy man, in, oh, so sorry, in order for a man to give a holy message, he has to live a holy life so that he has a power when he shares the message. What do you say? Amen? And that's why the Bible says, second Elijah, John the Baptist, he had a very simple lifestyle that helped him to do what God called him to do. This is very important, ladies and gentlemen. All right, now you begin to understand. So, so then uh, his characteristics, so even though he didn't go around saying, eat locusts and eat honey, wear camel's clothes, he didn't say it, but without verbal communication with his lifestyle, his silent message was really, what was it? Dedicated to holy and healthy life. That was his message. So he was a messenger, he was preaching Jesus and the sanctuary service, and he was preaching about preparing for the first coming of Jesus, and dedicated to holy and healthy life. And then Matthew chapter 14, verse 3, tells us how John the Baptist died. The Bible says, For Herod had, had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake. His brother Philip's what? Wife. So basically, he married his brother's wife. What do you think about that? For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. So King Herod, he didn't like John the Baptist. Especially his wife didn't like him. 
So instead of killing him, he just captured him, all right? And then he put him in prison. But then a time came, according to Matthew chapter 14, verse 6, but when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. So imagine the king threw this party and he gathered all these officials and his wife, daughter, she was dancing before the king and his guests. And then it says, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John Baptist's head in a charger. Whoa. So according to the Bible, how did John the Baptist, what happened to him? He got killed. Modern. All right. So second Elijah, who was he? Messenger. He, what did he preach? Jesus and the sanctuary service. And then what was other messages? Preparing for the first coming of Jesus. And then what, are, what about some other messages that he was actually preaching without, without words? He was preaching about dedicated to holy and healthy life. And then he was martyred for his faith. Now let's add the first Elijah together. First Elijah, messenger. His messages were keep God's commandments, worship the Creator, and then he was gone to heaven without seeing death. So what we're going to do, in order for us to figure out third Elijah, we're going to put all these characteristics together. Are you following? We're going to put them together, and then we are going to look for the third Elijah in the last days. So let's go. So we talk about the first Elijah in the Old Testament, the second Elijah in the New Testament, John the Baptist, and then the third Elijah, according to the book of Malachi, speaking about just before the coming of Christ, the second coming. So then third Elijah, who are they? Well, before we say who they are, let's just gather the characteristics. Third Elijah, it's got to be last messengers last messengers what are they preaching preparing for the second coming of Jesus what else keep God's commandments what else dedicated to holy and healthy life what else Jesus and the sanctuary service message so they preach about sanctuary message what else oh they preach about worship the Creator not the idols not the pagan gods worship the Creator what else in the last, among the third Elijah, last messengers, okay, some of them are going to be martyr for their faith, okay? And some of them are going to meet Jesus without seeing death. So those are the characteristics. So then, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to be part of, may I call it, the movement of third Elijah, you want to look for people that have those messages. Not so much the last, last two. You have no control. Okay? But the first, one, two, three, four, five, six. Those six characteristics are the ones that you need to look for. And you need to have in you, in your life. If you want to be part of that third Elijah in the last days. So if I can be a little more uh, specific about it, ladies and gentlemen, so you got to really think, which church, which church is really preaching about preparing for the second coming of Jesus? And you may say, well, many do, okay. Then which church really preaches about keeping God's commandments all Ten Commandments. And then you got to look for a church that preaches about living a holy life and healthy life. Any church like that? 
And you got to look for a church that really understands Jesus in relationship to sanctuary. And I'm not talking about the, just the Old Testament sanctuary, but sanctuary in heaven. Which church really preaches about that? And which church really emphasizes the point of worshiping the Creator? Which church? You decide. You can do some research. Find out. Yeah? But let's go a little deeper. All right, here we go. Since we're looking for the last messengers, let's figure out what the Bible says about the last day church. It says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and we studied this last night, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's very simple. When the Bible says remnant of her seed, <laughs> this group right here, remnant, is the third Elijah. It's got to be part. They have to be part of the third Elijah because they're the last day people, last day messengers. And then notice their characteristics. Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Very similar to first Elijah. And in a sense, very similar to second Elijah. Right there. So who are the third Elijah? This group called remnant right there. Who are they? Okay. So there, Elijah, last messengers with those characteristics. Let's continue. And then the Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. So since we're looking at, we're looking for the last messengers, I saw this Bible text in Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in how many world? All the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the what? And come, no, so check this out, check this out. So who do you think is going to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the end of the world? Based upon what we are studying tonight. Third Elijah, exactly. So the third Elijah are the ones who are going to preach the gospel, uh, a gospel that helps them to prepare for the coming of Jesus. They're going to preach that, preach that message to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. What does that mean? You want to look for a church that has a worldwide influence. You want to look for a church that has a worldwide influence. Not just talking about uh, which denomination has the biggest number. No, 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 no. We're talking about which church has the greatest global influence. And then what's interesting is that the Bible says, and then shall the end come. Meaning, this is very important. It says, the end will not come unless the gospel is preached to all the world. And if the end is not come, Jesus is, he will not come. You with me? So basically, Jesus cannot come unless the gospel is preached and gospel will not be preached if the third Elijahs are not doing their work. It's that simple. Jesus, when he came first time, he came because John the Baptist prepared the way. So Jesus cannot come back second time if third Elijah is not doing anything to prepare the way. You understand? And who are they? They're the one that will preach the gospel to every nation, kingdom, tongue, and people. So now you understand. So coming to church, you know, many times we're thinking, I just want to, go, I, I, the reason why I come to church, because I want to be saved. I understand you want to go to heaven. Me too. But according to the Bible, not only, you know, save me, I want to go to heaven, I want to live forever. No, no, it's bigger than that. What's bigger? We have a mission. What mission? Preach the gospel to every kinder tongue and people. You can see, you begin to see what's going on. You see, in the Old Testament, I will send you Elijah before the coming of Jesus. And it says, the gospel must be preached. So third Elijah, last messengers, again, similar message, preparing for the second coming of Jesus. And then, so then, I look for what is that gospel, the gospel of the kingdom that will go to all the world and all the nations? And then I saw this Bible text in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 6. The Bible says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting what? Gospel to preach unto them that dwelt on the earth, to every nation, kindred, 
tongue and people. Same thing as Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. When this gospel of the kingdom is gone to all the world, same idea here. But this is a little more specific. Instead of saying all the world or every nation, it says every nation, kinder, tongue, and people. Tongue and people. You know what that means? At least all the tribes in Philippines. How many tribes do you have? Did I just uh, insult you by calling your people tribes? Sounds like a jungle people, right? How many uh, dialects or how many tribes do you have? How many? Okay, nobody knows. But I know there are plenty. So when the Bible says every tongue, every, I mean, a people, kinder, listen, we're talking about, let me tell you something. Number one, are you thankful that you speak English? Say yes. yes. Or are you wishing you should speak Korean? <laughs> Someone says yes. But listen, there is a reason why, listen, there's a reason why, why your country is a country that knows so much about English. And guess what's happening with many Filipinos? They're just going all, so many different countries. Working, yes? You know why? People like to uh, hire Filipinos, why? Because they can speak English. When I call for text uh, support in America, Guess who answers my phone? Hey, it's Filipino <laughs> who lives in Manila. Yeah. They're every, why? Because they speak English. Listen, you speak English not just to make more money. English is a worldwide universal language. God has given you, and God has given you heart for truth, heart for worshiping the Creator. I believe, my friends, God has a special mission for the Filipinos in these islands. God wants to use you to send you to all of the world. Believe that. Trust me, your English is much better than Koreans. We're the one that makes Hyundai. But you're the one that speaks. Speaking is much better. Amen. So you can do something in the last days. This country right here, you can be one of those people that will fulfill going every nation, kinder, tongue, and people. Amen? So, look at this. So this is, again, description of the third Elijah. This is another uh, uh, text that shows who these Elijahs are. What are they doing? They are like angels, meaning messengers, flying in the midst of heaven, meaning they're going everywhere. Everybody can hear them. So then, what, is, what are the specific messages of the gospel? The everlasting gospel, the very next text explains, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgments come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. So here we have the everlasting gospel that will be preached to all the world in the last days in detail. So then, we have to conclude, these are the messages that the third Elijah will proclaim and preach. And what are those messages? Number one, the Bible says what? Fear God. So when the Bible says fear God, what does that mean? When we say fear God, what does that mean? Ooh, I'm so, I'm, I am so afraid of him. Is that, what, is, is that, what, that mean, what that means? Fear God, what does that mean? Let's, let's find out from the Bible. In the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 2, verse 12. You remember when Abraham was asked to offer up his son. And he said, remember Abraham, he was about to slay his own son because God asked him to offer his son. God asked him to give him the best. But then God stopped him. And he said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou, what? Fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. 
So when Abraham, so when Abraham went like this, when he raised his knife up, oh, when he's about to strike his son, God says, Abraham, stop. Now I know you fear me. Now you tell me. What does it mean to fear God? Obedience, exactly. Exactly. So when the Bible says fear God, it just simply means obey Him. But at the same time, it is not just obedience. According to the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, it says, by faith, by what? Faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. So when Abraham went like this, oh, this action, this bodily action was revealing that Abraham had what? Faith in God, exactly. So this means faith, this means obedience. Faith and obedience. So when the Bible says, fear God means have faith that will lead you to obey God. What do you say? That was the message. Fear God. So third Elijah, the last day messengers, what are they preaching? Prepare for the second coming of Jesus and then basically complete faith in God, which, which includes obedience to Him. Let's continue. Let's dig a little more into this message, fear God. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 2, the Bible says this, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to what? Keep all his statutes and his commandments. So what does it mean to fear God according to the Bible? Keep his commandments. Another one, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. You see? So third Elijah, who are they? Messengers. What are they preaching? Preparing for the second coming of Jesus. And what's that include? Complete faith in God. What else? Keep God's commandments. Same as the first Elijah and similar to the second Elijah. We continue. And the Bible says, saying with a loud voice, fear God, we study that. And then the next line, it says, give glory to Him. What does that mean, give glory to Him? You give God glory. What does that mean, glory? Let's find out from the Bible. In the Bible, in the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verse 18, one time Moses, he made this request. And he said, I beseech thee, meaning I beg of you, O God. God, please show me thy glory. So we're trying to define what glory means. And the very next text, the Bible says this. And he said, I will make all my, what? Goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show what? Mercy on whom I will show mercy. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, glory equals goodness, name, gracious, mercy. So then, what are goodness, name, gracious, mercy? Basically, goodness, name, grace, mercy, characters of God. So when the Bible says, give glory to Him, simply means reflect God's character. Exactly. So that's the message. Fear God. Have faith in Him. Complete faith in Him. Fear God. Keep His commandments. Give glory to Him. Reflect His character. That's the final message. That's the everlasting gospel. That message will need to go to every nation, kinder, tongue, and people. And then, what, um, what are some other ways that we can give God the glory? According to the Bible, whether therefore ye what? Eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the what? Ah, so how do you give God glory? Not only reflecting his character, but you, can, you, you, can, you should also reflect his character in the things that you eat and drink. And ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to eating and drinking, we're basically talking about how we should maintain our health. 
And the Bible says the body is a temple of the living God. The body is a temple of God. So therefore, you got to preserve your body in the best condition. I understand because this world has fallen, there are diseases. However, God is asking us to do your best to live a very healthy life. See, so when the Bible says give glory to Him, reflect His character also means whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, meaning your lifestyle should be glorifying to God. Same message as John the Baptist. Very similar. So here we see characteristics of the Elijah message being repeated. Third Elijah, last messengers, preparing for the second coming of Jesus, proclaiming or preaching, telling people to have a complete faith in God. They're also preaching, keep God's commandments, and same, dedicated to holy and healthy life. And then the Bible says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him for the what? Hour of His judgment has come. Oh, let me tell you, you know, since this tonight is our last night, I wish I had more time to tell you more about this, but um, you can take more studies from the uh, pastors. But uh, when the Bible says the hour of His judgment has come, this is really talking about sanctuary message. Yes, I'm going to just tell you what it is without even explaining to you because it takes so much time to explain what that means. But basically, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when the Bible says the hour of His judgment has come, according to the Jewish people, the way they understand the judgment hour, judgment hour happens for them on the Day of Atonement. What did I say? The Day of Atonement. If you study the Day of Atonement, Jewish people regard that day to be the Day of Judgment. And the Day of Atonement has a specific hour, specific time schedule. Okay? So, when the Bible says the hour of the judgment has come, basically, the judgment will happen in the sanctuary, not earthly sanctuary, but heavenly sanctuary, not with earthly high priest, but with heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ. So, so this is really pointing to Jesus and the sanctuary service. Again, repeating exactly what John the Baptist was preaching. So you can see third Elijah already has uh, so many characteristics from first Elijah, second Elijah, all put together. Bible is repeating itself. And then Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, the Bible says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of judgment has come. And what? Worship Him that made heaven and earth and seas and the fountains of water. Ah, the, the, it's like, by the way, look at this. At least in English, look at this. Fear God, how many words? How many words? Two, okay. Give glory to Him, how many words? How many words? Four, okay. For the hour of His judgment has come. How many words? Okay, let's count together. For the hour of His judgment is? How many words? A. Interesting. Two, four, A. Right? Okay, how many words? Worship Him. Worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. How many? Sixteen. It's not interesting. It's not interesting. Now, that's how it is in English, but I believe it's similar in Greek. So, so what is this idea of this? This, is, this has this crescendo. You understand? Crescendo effect. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, um, fear God is a preparation for worshiping the worshiping that made heaven and earth. You with me? Give Him glory is a preparation of worship Him that made heaven and earth. The hour of judgment has come. It's really part of worship Him that made it heaven and earth. So the the so if I can say the greatest message in this verse in Revelation chapter fourteen verse seven, the greatest message is the conclusion, the final conclusion of everything. Worship Him that made heaven and earth. What does that mean? Worship the Creator. 
basically, if you fear God, worship the Creator. If you give glory to Him, worship the Creator. Why? For the hour of His judgment is come. That's how we're going to be judged. So, ladies and gentlemen, how do we? Is there a specific way that we should worship the Creator? Let's find out. By the way, can't you see? Worship the Creator is a, re a repetition of the first Elijah's message. So it is very clear. Third Elijah, they, uh, they have similar messages of the first Elijah and the second Elijah. But what, in what way we should worship the Creator or the living God? The Bible says the living God which made heaven and earth and the seas and all the things are therein. And you already know that this, is there a specific instruction how we should worship the Creator in the Bible? Is there? Is there a specific instruction in the Bible how we should worship the Creator? Yes. You see how everything comes together to this idea? And again, you may be thinking, oh, you're just pushing for Saturday Sabbath. I know it may sound like that, but ladies and gentlemen, again, as God used the tree of the knowledge and good and evil, something trivial, something really small, something is not a big deal looking thing, to bring about the test, he is using Sabbath for some reason, his divine plan, his divine idea, he's using Sabbath to test people's loyalty, their trust, their faith, and their love for God. Because the Bible keeps saying, worship the Creator, worship the Creator. How? I mean, can, can we just say, I worship the Creator in my mind? But yeah, yeah, you can do that. But the Bible has a specific instruction how you should acknowledge the Creator. According to the Bible, according to the Bible, we should acknowledge the, acknowledge the Creator every seventh day Sabbath. That's why in the Ten Commandments, the commandment of God, the foundation of God's throne, the foundation of God's government, in the Ten Commandments, God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So God is asking, remember me by remembering the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So everything comes together. Third Elijah, who are they? Last messengers. What are they preaching? Preparing for the second coming of Jesus. What other messages? Have complete faith in God. What else? Keep God's commandments. What else? Dedicated to holy and healthy life. What else? They're preaching about Jesus in the sanctuary service in heaven. What else? Proclaiming, worship the Creator. And what else? Keeping Seventh-day Sabbath. That comes with it. And then what else? Some of them are going to be martyred. And what else? Some of them will see Jesus without seeing death. There you go. So, ladies and gentlemen, listen, I know, I know, I know what you're thinking. Listen, I have no desire to force anyone to be part of, you know, Seventh-day Adventist Church or this movement. I have no desire, but just reason with me. Just reason with me. As you can see, God said, let's summarize. God says, I will send you Elijah before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Meaning, I will send you Elijah before the second coming of Christ. Who are these Elijahs? It's not little Elijah coming down from heaven to earth. No, no, no. How do we know? Because we already have, we already have symbolic Elijah. Who? John the Baptist. So then, the last day Elijahs, they're also people like John the Baptist, but have the spirit and the power of Elijah. Who are they? How do you define who they are? Well, study the characteristics of the first Elijah, study the characteristics of the second Elijah, put those characteristics together, and then define. And we saw a lot of that in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, we see all these characteristics pointing into the remnant church, the final messengers, the final angels flying in the, in the sky, in heaven, proclaiming these messages. Who are they? So then, all you need to do, okay, I, first of all, do you want to live according to the Bible? Do you want to be part of God's prophecy? If that is your desire, ladies and gentlemen, all you need to do is this. According to the Bible, it looks like there's a movement in the last days. So which movement, or may I even say, which church has 
all these characteristics. Number one, which church really preaches about preparing for the second coming of Jesus? Which church really preaches about preaching complete, having complete faith in God? And you may say, a lot of churches. No, and I agree with you. There are many other churches. They also preach things like that. And then you ask the question, which church really teaches about keeping all God's commandments? Which church really teaches about living healthy life? Which church really teaches about Jesus and the sanctuary service in heaven? Which church really promotes the idea of worship the Creator? Which church really preached the message of keeping Seventh-day Sabbath? Now you decide. Which church is that? As far as I, I, if you can show me any other denomination, any other church that has all those characteristics, you let me know. But as far as I can see, sincerely, with my breakdancing background, I'm a just simple guy, I'm from the street, I've, I'm from the ghetto, okay? But I have done my studies, I have traveled more than actually 50 countries, I looked around, I looked, I looked for a, a movement or a denomination, church, ladies and gentlemen, as far as I know, there's only one church that has all these characteristics. No, no, no. And a lot of these people, they may not be perfect. They have defects of character. They have rooms to grow. So I'm not looking for perfect people church. You're not going to find that. But what I'm looking for is church that has all the teachings of the third Elijah. And ladies and gentlemen, I conclude. Let me humbly humble, in a very humble way, introduce to you the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we never say, oh, we are third Elijah, so therefore we're better than all these Sunday churches. If you say that, you disqualify to be a third Elijah. You should get fired. Don't say things like that. We are not better than other people because, just because we have the message. Listen, don't think that way. God has given this group of people the knowledge of the Bible. So take it humbly, but with faith and meekness, follow God's ways, amen? Because even, even many Adventists, they can be lazy, lukewarm, spiritually dead, yeah, legalistic, they're not so loving. Some Seventh-day Adventists, their face looks like they're always eating lemon. <laughs> so do we have any uh, Sunday keepers here today? I mean, I shouldn't say Sunday keepers, other Christians, other denominations. When you see sour-faced Seventh-day Adventists, they don't represent SDA. They actually represent SAD. Okay? They are not SDA, they're SAD, okay? So, so, so don't, don't get confused. So, and again, don't make the decision based upon, you know, if the church, the people are all perfect. No. But if you really think about it, ladies and gentlemen, God is creating this movement. As far as I know, I am thankful to be Seventh-day Adventist Christian. How about you? And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, there follow another what? Angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her. You see, these, see that it says she, Babylon is she. And she caused the nations to commit fornication. These are very similar characteristics as Ahab and Jezebel. Jezebel, woman, even though she is not called Babylon, but the things that she was teaching, it belongs to Babylon. And did she, did she cause other people to commit fornication? Yes, very similar idea. So 
Again, the setting, even the setting of the first Elijah will be repeated in the last days. We will have, may I say, spiritual Jezebel, or the Bible just simply calls Babylon. So in the last days, we're going to have Babylon building their kingdom, causing the nations to commit spiritual fornication. At the same time, we're going to have third Elijah proclaiming the message to every nation, tongue, and people. And just like the first Elijah, asking people to make that final decision, and the third Elijah will do the same thing by proclaiming the third angel follow them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. And the verse continue with the idea that they shall receive the wrath of God. So sad, but yet it is an urgent message. It is a serious message. It is a message of you decide, you choose true God. You, you, you study the Bible and you understand exactly what the Bible is requiring. And then in the same chapter, Revelation chapter 14, verse 2, 12, the Bible says, here is the what? Patience of the saints, meaning they will endure unto the end. They will maintain unto the end. Here are they that what? Keep the commitments of God and? You see, actually, do you remember all those characteristics of first Elijah and the second Elijah? Really? If we can summarize all of them into just few words, this is it. Patience of the saints, keep the commitments of God and faith of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, look, the Bible is so clear. So the question is, do you want to be part of the Elijah movement? That is the final question. And this question is given to Adventists and uh, Catholics, Presbyterian, uh, Church of Christ, other denominations as well. Okay, you want to think about putting SDA aside for a second? Just ask the question based upon the Bible. Based upon the Bible, okay? Don't think, don't think as a denomination, but just based upon the Bible, do you see the prophecy of third Elijah, yes or no? Do you see their characteristics? All right then. Here's a question. Do you want to have the characteristics of the third Elijah? So then, if you do have characteristics of the third Elijah, if you have to choose a denomination, which denomination will fit all those characteristics? As far as I know, it is Seventh-day Adventist. My friends, then, who are third Elijahs? Is it only the Seventh-day Adventists? Well, it sounds like that, but basically at the end, those who live, those who know, and those who live, and those who proclaim three angels' messages, or those messages that we've been sharing the first angel, fear God and give glory to him. Second angel, Babylon is falling, is falling. Third angel, do not receive the mark of the beast. Whoever knows about those messages, lead those messages, and give those messages, ladies and gentlemen, they are the third Elijah. And just because my Adventist friends and brothers and sisters, just because you're Adventist, that doesn't mean you're automatically third Elijah. Why? because you have to know the message, you have to live the message, and you have to give the message. You cannot be spiritually lazy. You cannot. Because my friend Jesus is wanting to come back. He wants to come back, but he cannot come back unless there is third Elijah preparing the way. Give the message to every nation, kingdom, tongue, and people. But ladies and gentlemen, many people treat the church like a club, just a once a week thing. They don't treat the, the, the gospel and, and what God is asking us to do as a full-time thing. They just, they just put God as a 10%. They put God as a, like a 15% or 7% or 8%. Or they put God as something that is what you do with the leftover money, leftover time. Just in case, if there is really heaven, you, kinda, you hope that you will make to heaven. So you just give God just the 
the menial, I mean, menial, just minimum, just the leftover crumbs of your time, money, your heart, your mind. This kind of thinking must be eradicated. It must be transformed. We got to have reformation. We got to think different. Our first mission, ladies and gentlemen, if you really want to be a blessing to the world, is to bring Jesus back sooner. And how do you do that? Do what the Bible says. Prepare the way for the Lord to come. And that is join the third Elijah message and give the message to every, not, every nation, kingdom time people. Is that your wish? You might say, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a Bible worker. No, 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 no. You don't have to be. I don't know how to speak. No, you don't need to know how to speak. But you just need to have the welling heart and ask God, God, use me in a silent way or verbal way or in a very active way, use me to help other people to get ready for the coming of Christ. Is that your desire? That is my final uh, question, final appeal to you. With this, with this whole seminar on you know, make, uh, the, the book of Revelation made simple seminar, uh, the final conclusion is for you to know God and love Him and to be part of this final great movement. And let me tell you something. When you do make that decision, you are going to have oppositions. You are going to have oppositions. People will say, oh, be realistic. Take care of yourself, your future, retirement, benefit, insurance, investments, success, achievement, reputation, be responsible. You know, you know what they're saying? When people say that, no, should we be responsible? Yeah, should we uh, do some investment? No problem. Should we work? No problem. Uh, should we be successful? No problem. But can't you understand? You can still be successful and you can still make money, but your heart, your, your utmost, foremost heart is not about those things. Your heart is, I want Jesus to come back soon. Do you understand that? You have to have that in the mindset so it will come out in your activity, in your lifestyle, and people will see who you are. But let me tell you something. You will have oppositions. People, kind of, people, are, just, people are just basically saying, don't worry about second coming. Just live your life. You know, when you live your life like that, life becomes without meaning. I remember, I remember, I had a conviction in my heart. Here I am, I'm, I'm, I'm 19. I just became Christian two years ago. Here I am, 19. And my mom, my mom, Korean mom, she is pushing me to become a dentist. Dentist. Do they make good money? Yeah, they make good money. <laughs> wow, they can make really good money. Is that a stable job? Yeah, it's a stable job. Dentist. <laughs> Many Korean men are dentists. <laughs> yeah, in, 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 in America? Yeah, many Korean dentists. Yeah, but me, I have no heart. I have no desire to look at people's mouth <laughs> all day long. Say, ah, uh, that will kill me. I, I would just say, please just eat me when you open your mouth. I feel so miserable doing this. I mean, that's not my passion. I have no desire. You know, uh, before this, I was trying to study civil engineering. Why? Because I was good at math. But you know what happened? as I'm calculating how tall the antenna should be, how wide the antenna should be as a simple engineering, you know, calculating the mathematic equation, some things keep telling me, study the Bible, study the Bible, study the Bible, just like that. So I'm like, okay, I gotta change my, uh, my major. So I went to a different college and my mother is like, study dentist. 
And I'm like, Mom, I think I should study the Bible. Oh, don't worry, Peter. Become dentist first. Have a good job and you can still preach. Makes sense. Now, are some people called to be a doctor? Yes. Then you become doctor, no problem. Some people called to be a dentist? Yeah, God bless you. Good luck. <laughs> Thank God there are people like you. Some people, they get excited when they walk around and see people's teeth. <gasps> Mission. Say, ah. Right? <laughs> Praise God. Okay? But just because you're called to be a dentist or just you know, be a doctor, again, don't forget, that is not your first job. Amen? Your first job for the kingdom of God. What do you say? So here I am like, Mom. But then the conviction was coming to me really hard. Like, I got to study the Bible. I mean, I had no desire to become pastor. I had no desire to become an uh, evangelist. No, I just want to study the truth. You know why? Because I felt that Jesus is coming soon. I felt that Jesus is coming soon. It, it, and and just, just looking back, that feeling is really Jesus was calling me to be part of Third Elijah. Because you can be a Seventh Adventist, but you may not be a Third Elijah. And I felt that calling. God is calling me, but I gotta, I gotta tell my mom that I'm gonna change my major. I wanna go somewhere to study Bible. But I cannot tell her, she will kill me. Yeah, Korean people are like that. How come I didn't, I was not born in the Philippines? But anyhow, so one day, my mom was in my room. And I was looking at her, looking for the opportunity to tell her the news. She is in my room. I think she is in the good mood. I said, oh, this is time. I said, mom, what? Mom, I want to study Bible. And just for her, I mean, it's not really in my mind, but just for her sake to understand my intention, I need to become a pastor. I, I say it like that. I want to become pastor. You know what she said? No. Why do you want to become a pastor? If you become pastor, if you become pastor, you are starved to death. How are you going to support your wife and your children? I was not even married. She's already thinking about wife and children. I said, Mom, God is really calling me. I really want to study the Bible. She goes, no, 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 no. And she goes, what kind of school is this? I'm like, oh, maybe she changed her mind. Mom, it's a good school. And I show her the college brochure. But the college brochure is only a, like a trifold, like a little piece of paper. But this college is run by Seventh-day Adventist. Student number is only 80 students. And the dormitory is made out of log. And the picture that they took for the brochure, I think they took the picture during autumn, fall. All the leaves are dead. And they don't have a big building, they have a log house and one big building, but it looks like Dracula's house. <laughs> and I, I said, Mom, I mean, I was innocent, I didn't know, you know, Seventh day Adventist, and they serve a uh, vegetarian diet, I mean, vegan diet, so I was looking for a healthy diet too, and, and, and I want to study the Bible. I said, Mom, it's a really good school, you know, here, here. And she's like, looking at the picture, and she's like, <laughs> No way, you're not going there. Is this college credited? No, it's not credited. No, 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 you're not going there. No way. I say, Mom, please. Jesus is coming back soon. Please let me do this. And she went, <sighs> Okay. <clears throat> you can go. Oh, mom, thank you. So I was so happy. 
Praise God. Amen? Amen. Oh, she changed her mind. Oh, so God is calling me to be part of that third Elijah movement. Now I can go and study the Bible and really be active. Praise the Lord. Mm. But the very next day, the very next day, my mom march, marches into my room. Peter, no, you cannot go to the college. Wow, mom can change her mind so fast. I should have recorded what she said yesterday. Uh, no, no iPhone back in those days. I said, Mom, please. She goes, no, 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 no. You got to study dentistry. You have to study maybe a doctor. Maybe you should become a lawyer. Look at all these, you know, all these uh, big people in the church. You know, they work, they work as a doctor. They preach. They work as a lawyer. They preach. Uh, you, can, you can do like them. I said, Mom, please, please. No, no, no. You cannot go. So, I had to say something to declare my decision. I have to say it strong, really strong. So this is what I said. I have to tell her, Mom, I love you, but I love God more. When I said that, she went like this. Yeah, she literally she went, I love God more, Mom. And when she went like that, I can tell. I won the battle. <laughs> and she's like this. And while she's doing like this, I said, Mom, I need $100 application fee. Few days later, few days later, I was in her room. And then as she's going out to her work, she had a check in her hand. And she went like this. Here. She threw the check. And she walked out, door slammed. And, and the check was. At that time, my American stepfather, my real father passed away, my American stepfather, not Adventist, okay? My sisters, not Adventist, only my mom, but my mom, her expression to me, it's like, why do you have to be so religious? If, if, if you don't want to do what I want to do, just get out. It was that kind of action. You understand? I was only 19. A tear was coming down from my eyes. I, went, I, I got on my knees and I held a check like this. Tears coming out. I said, God, whatever it costs, I'm willing to follow you. And then... A time came for me to go to the school. No goodbye party. Nobody has, you know, farewell party. I just packed my stuff in my car. I just left. And I said to God, God, you be my father, you be my mom. And I went to school. And there, Step by step, I learned the Bible, <laughs> true education. I learned what it means to develop character. And then, every time there is a, like a school break, I go home. And every time I go home, according to my mom, she says, Peter, every time you come home, you are different. You're becoming better and better and better. And then, other times she wrote a, and then a few years later, she wrote a letter to me. She says, Peter, your school is a good school. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. And then she says, Peter, when you preach, preach with power. Yes, mom. 
because I decided to follow God, through my decision, God bless my mom to change your mind. And then a few years later, when I came home, my American stepfather, he said to me, oh, Peter, by the way, I went to the local Seventh Adventist Church, attended Daniel Revelation Seminar twice, and I got baptized. <laughs> I'm a Seventh Adventist. I looked at him, oh, you Seventh Adventist now? Oh, praise God. <laughs> is, is God good, amen? amen? He worked it out. He's making things happen. And let me tell you something. When you put God first, God will provide everything else. Sometimes not right away, but be patient. Here are the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and faith of Jesus. My friends, it does require sacrifice to join the movement. But let me tell you something. In the last days, there are many, 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 many different movements. But I want to be in the movement that is according to the Bible. What do you say? Amen. Is that your desire? If, if it is, please stand where you are. God bless you. And tonight, I'm going to make a special appeal. Because I know there are some people here have not got into, uh, have not received baptism. <laughs> Because in order to be part of this third Elijah's movement, as far as I know, you want to experience that baptism to declare publicly your decision for following God all the way. And I know there are many of you here tonight, many of you here tonight, you're not ready to get baptized so soon. And believe me, uh, I, I don't recommend people you know, get baptized so quickly. So please don't get baptized so quickly unless you know for sure God is, uh, God has given you the knowledge and you are making intellectual and spiritual decision. But how, how, however, I'm, I'm sure today there are many of you, you want to make that decision, you want to make that, <clears throat> that choice and step out and get yourselves ready for baptism. Not ready to get baptism right away, but you're just simply saying, God, I'm, I'm convinced, I'm convicted, and I just need some more Bible studies. So I will be ready to make that final decision later. If you are that person tonight, I know many of you are already baptized, so I understand. But if you are that person tonight, it might be just one person or two people. If you are that person, you're saying, God, I'm excited, I see the glory, I see the promise, I see the purpose, I see the mission and the vision. Tonight, I want to make that decision. So prepare me. God, please give me more Bible study so that I'll be ready for baptism. If I'm talking to you, please come to the front. There might be that one person or two people. If, if I'm talking to you, please come. God bless you, sister. God bless you, brother. Thank you. Is there anyone else? God bless you, sister. Always coming, all the time. Praise the Lord. God bless you, sister. Is there anyone else? All right. Look at, look at these third Elijahs coming, ladies and gentlemen. They're coming right now. Praise the Lord. God bless you. God bless you. And some of you, maybe you're in uh, like a nursing program, maybe some other program, but maybe tonight you're, you're, you're feeling conviction that the Lord is calling you to become preacher, a pastor. If you feel that way, you also come to the front. God bless you, sister. Is there anyone else? You're saying, God, prepare me for baptism. Teach me more Bible study. God bless you, sister. Blessings to you. Is there anyone else? Come closer. We're going to have a special prayer for you guys. And uh, where's our local pastor here? If the pastor can hear me, please uh, just spend some time with them. Maybe take their names down for now. God bless you, sister. Is there anyone else? This is our last night. And uh, by the way, I have my last message tomorrow morning. 
10 o'clock, 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. So please, I want to invite all of you to spend the Sabbath with us um, 10 o'clock in the morning. And we have a Bible study at 9 a.m. So you can come for a Bible study at 9 a.m. and then come for the main service at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. And my main topic is going to be our Heavenly Father. It's one of my favorite message from Matthew. Okay? But tonight, again, I want to extend the invitation. If the Lord is calling you tonight and you are feeling the conviction, oh, God has asked me to step out, take that first step. There will be many more steps, understand? But tonight, God is asking you to make that first step. Say, Lord, give me more preparation. Give me more Bible study. I want to get myself ready. If I'm talking to you, please come to the front. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? Come to the front. Please come. Could you come a little closer to the front? Blessings to you. Blessings to you. God bless you. Looks like we have mom to be. Alex, God bless you. Good to see you here. Praise the Lord. Amen? Is there anyone else who wants to join this uh, small group up here making their decision, their choice this evening? If you are, if I'm speaking to you tonight, don't hesitate. Let the Spirit of God move you and come to the front. Anyone else? God bless you, brother. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Anybody in the, in the second floor, if, if God is speaking to you, you feel the tug, you feel the conviction was in your heart. It's an opportunity for you to take a stand. I hate to miss someone. Anyone else? Anyone else tonight? There's always that shy one or the hesitating one. There's always one that says, oh, I'm not ready to make a commitment. I understand. Tonight, actually, is a, a small commitment to a bigger commitment. And this commitment is simply saying, Lord, prepare me. Give me more Bible study. Help me to understand a little more that I might be ready for baptism. And then, obviously, it is totally up to you. If you see that, this is not what you want. There's no one, there's no one here who's going to force you, twist your arm, harass you. There's none of that. It's going to be, God bless you, brother. Good to see you here. It's going to be totally up to you. But give, your, give, you, give, give yourselves a chance, a, gr a great opportunity to see the light, see the truth. And to see exactly what the Bible says. Anyone else? Final call. Anyone else? Okay. Now, my second appeal is going to be, it may not be preparation for baptism, but you have a desire to just study the Bible more. Yeah? If, if you are one of those people, please raise your hands. You just want to study the Bible more. Blessings to you. God bless you. God bless you. Blessings to you. Make sure you speak to the pastor. Amen? Okay? And, and so the pastor can follow up with that. Okay? Praise the Lord. Is there anyone else tonight? The final, final opportunity. It's the last night tonight. Anyone? All right. Let's pray together. Pastor, can you come down? And would you have the honor to have the final prayer for your, your people and your flock this evening? And God has chosen you to be that shepherd, that spiritual shepherd. So here are people, you have people here, they are seeking for the truth, seeking for the light. May God bless you, Pastor. So Pastor, please.
pray for all of us. Let's come together, guys. Come together. Come. Good to have you. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we humbly come to your throne of grace this beautiful evening. What a wonderful Sabbath to experience the power of the gospel. Thank you, Lord, for the working of the Holy Spirit. We praise your name for using Peter Gregory. This very evening, here comes the young people. They accepted Jesus as their personal Savior. They have learned the message. They understand. And they were able to have that commitment, that love publicly, showing that they have that dedication that one day soon they will be able to demonstrate having that profession of faith in Christ as their personal Savior and have that desire to live a new life in Him. Lord, kindly you bless that decision tonight. Tomorrow, there are three of them have that dedication to have baptism. Here comes the other. They have that desire also very soon. I know, I know, Lord, that you are the one calling. I know that you have a very sacred message, especially in our time these last days. Help us to comprehend. Help us to follow. Help us, O oh Lord, to study more and to learn about your love. Today I pray for the blessings from heaven, especially for these people, these brethren, our beloved bro brothers and sisters who come forward with a boldness and courageous spirit because of thy great faith that you have given, a special gift to them. Lord, thank you for using this church. Thank you for using our brethren, our church members, to invite friends that we will be able to understand the Bible more fully and we can have that assurance that one day soon you will gather your people. Thank you, Lord, that this very evening you are willing to accept our humble request. Bless this decision. I know that your coming is very soon. Help us and make us ready to that wonderful day that you promised to each one. Thank you, Lord, for using us. Help us to be a blessing to others. Thank you for leading us tonight. And thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit since last Friday till this evening. Thank you, Lord, for granting our request. Thank you for hearing our prayers. And thank you for using Peter Gregory. For thy glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.